Good morning. Welcome to all of you here in person and those worshiping with us online. My name is Reverend Lauren Radzik, and I am one of the pastors here. If you're joining us in person, masks are optional, and we give you thanks for all that you do to care for one another. Today, you'll notice our front pew is empty, and that means that Char Charlie Tobias, our minister of congregational care, is not with us. Don't worry, he's alive and well, and he is actually in Columbus celebrating Harrison's first birthday. So we wish Harry a happy birthday, and we wish Grandpa and Grandma lots of snuggles and fun time. That means if you are joining us in person and you have a prayer request you would like to share, you'll need to come and bring it up front to me today during one of our hymns, or you can just leave it in the back and we'll collect them and put them on the prayer list per usual. If you are joining us online, we don't have a person who's recording those things today, but I promise you we will record those and share those on our prayer list this week. We are so grateful for the opportunity to pray with and for you and those you love. Please take a moment and let us know that you are here with us today, whether that's in person or online. In person, that means that there are red books in the ends of your pews on either end. We'd love for you to sign your name and fill that out and pass it along to your neighbors, ensuring that those make it back to the center or outside aisles. And if you really want to be helpful and rip out the sheet once your row is completely done with that, that would be helpful for our volunteers who go and pick those up after church. Today, we welcome our musicians, Amy and Ashley, who are helping to lead us in worship today. We give thanks for their talents that are here with us. I also want to let you know that we had a successful interview with a music and choir director person this week, and we are inviting him back. His name is Emilio, and we are inviting him back on May 19th to rehearse with the choir and do an audition interview. So if you would like to sing, if you've ever sung before, if you've never sung before, and you would like to be a part of the choir, we would love for you to come and pick up some music. Susan Hose will have that available and have all the details. That rehearsal will be at 7 o'clock, and we'd love for you to come and sing and rehearse with the choir and check out Emilio and, uh, before we make our final decision. And for the rest of us, we invite you to pray that that continues to be a successful opportunity. Friends, following worship today, we invite you to the Holbrook Room for coffee and donuts and fellowship time. There's all kinds of wonderful and lovely things there. And the monies that are collected will go to our new special project fund, which the United Church Board, Unified Church Board, will be able to collate into something that benefits the community here. So friends, we are grateful for your presence in worship today. We look forward to seeing what God will do and how God will move among us today. And we invite you to stand and join together in our call to worship. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Those of you at home, good to see you too in my heart. Oh God, the Lord our God. Oh, now can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I got to pay more attention to the guys at the back. Oh Lord our God, we praise you. We cried to you for help and you answered us. You have restored our lives. You have rescued us from the grave. Come and worship the living God. Today we lift our voices in praise, giving thanks for the God of second chances and new life. This is a call to confession. When your soul is suffering in silence, call out to the Lord our God who heals our brokenness, who lifts us up from the pit and restores our lives. Let us confess our sin together. Lord God, in the light of your glory, we see the little we have done, the suffering we have caused, the good we have refused, and the truth we have denied. Heal us of our sin, wash us in your mercy, and feed us with your grace, so that we may follow your way and tell the good news of the gospel. Amen. 
the assurance of forgiveness, rise up from the dust, cast off the shroud of sorrow, and put on the joy of the Lord. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are forgiven and free. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. I'm going to sing hymn number uh, 432. For those of you who are at home, sing along. Good morning, good morning. How are you all this morning? Good. I'm so glad that you are here. My name is Pastor Lauren. Today, our lesson for children's time comes from the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter, and it tells the story of Jesus meeting the disciples after the resurrection. After the resurrection, Peter and the other disciples went out to go fishing. They fished all night long, but they didn't catch a single fish. Tired from a long night of fishing and disappointed that they hadn't caught anything, Peter and the disciples returned to shore only to find Jesus waiting for them on the beach. Upon learning they hadn't caught any fish at all, Jesus told the disciples to take their boat back out onto the sea into deeper water and to cast their nets again. Even though the disciples were tired and exhausted, they did what Jesus asked and they caught more fish than their nets could hold. When they got off the boat, Jesus was cooking fish on the fire and had bread ready for them to eat. He invited the disciples to sit down and eat with them and began to teach. He talked especially to Peter, who had denied him three times, and three times he asked Peter, do you love me? Each time Peter answered, yes, Lord, and Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Take care of my people. Follow me. Do you ever wish that you could have breakfast with Jesus? That would be pretty cool. What do you think would happen if you had breakfast with Jesus? Good. 
It's good. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think you'd have lots of questions for Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we would listen to what Jesus said. We might ask him questions. We might want to know if he really loves us, right? That's what the first disciples wanted to know when Jesus met them on the beach for breakfast. Peter was a little bit sad that he had denied Jesus three times. He felt really bad about that. And so Jesus came up to him, and he met him exactly where he was, And he told him exactly what he needed to hear. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, of course, Jesus, I love you. And then he said, I have a special job for you. The special job is to take care of my people. And Jesus said that in a funny way. He said, feed my sheep or take care of my lambs. What Jesus really meant was, Peter, your special job and all of us, our special job is to go out and take care of each other to make sure people have food and clothes, to make sure people know about God's love, to make sure people know about Jesus. The good news is that Jesus always meets us wherever we are. So this week, I want you to make a list of the things that you might ask Jesus and the things that Jesus might ask you if you were to have breakfast together. And when you're done making that list, either in your head or on paper, with a picture or with words, share it with an adult in your life. It could be me, it could be your Sunday school teachers, it could be your parents or caregivers or family members. Share that list, and we would love to talk about some of those questions you have. Can we pray a repeat after me prayer together? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us and for sending Jesus. Thank you for meeting us right where we are and inviting us to follow you. Give us courage to say yes every day. Amen. Thanks for coming in, guys. You guys will get to go back and do some Sunday school, and we will see you back for communion. Yes, what's the book for today? James. James is a great book. Awesome. Thanks for coming in, guys. Yes. The disciples. You are a disciple. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for coming in, guys. Our scripture um, reading right now is Acts 9, 1 through 20. It's the conversion of Saul. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus called Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named 
Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he is seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hand on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus. Immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Our next hymn is, Lord, You Have Come to the Lake Show, number 344.
the ghost gospel scripture today is John 21, 1 through 19, where Jesus appears to seven disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Gal Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. <coughs> Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was how the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, your Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Friends, let's pray. Loving God, you have gathered us today to remind us of your love sent to us through Jesus. Today we come to worship, longing for your presence to be real in our midst. So come, Holy Spirit. Open our eyes to your grace around us. Teach us to be compassionate, always working for justice. Lord, we love you, and you ask us to feed your sheep to care for others that you have placed in our paths, to go out and share the good news, to be your disciples. May our worship today empower us to do just that, and may we go forth from this place singing your praise and sharing your love and hope with each person we meet. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. 
If there were an alternate title for today's gospel lesson, I might title it Breakfast on the Beach. The beach is one of my favorite places. There's something about the smell of the air and the crash of the waves on the shoreline, the warm, hopefully, sand beneath my feet that connects me to God. In fact, I'm quite sure that if Jesus needed to tell me something really important, he would do it when I made my way to the water or to the beach. Perhaps my fascination with sand and waves stems from the fact that I grew up about an hour and a half south of here, not close to any body of water that really had waves. Yes, yes, Lake Erie was not that far away, but we never went there. The closest to water we got growing up was the local high school pool where we took swimming lessons and the muddy ponds in our friend's yards or the woods. There aren't any beaches, at least not real beaches, in those places. As I've grown older, though, I've found myself with a variety of opportunities to be near water or beaches. On a high school band trip to Florida, I saw the ocean for the very first time. In college, I traveled to Myrtle Beach with the gospel choir and spent a week leading a mission trip with a local church near a beach. And then I moved to Boston for seminary. And anywhere I went, I was never too far from the water. Maybe not a beach per se, but I could still find a place to sit and hear the crashing of the waves. It was my favorite way to spend a day when I was avoiding doing homework. Or maybe when I was reading a textbook on a bench. In college, it was on a beach that I had my conversion experience, like Saul in our reading from Acts. After deciding and running from God's call that I received as a youth at summer camp, and deciding that music therapy wasn't my ultimate career path, I dove headfirst into the field of psychology. By the time I reached the end of my sophomore year, I had firmly decided that I was going to be a professional mental health counselor, and I'd oriented my psychology degree and coursework in that way. But with two years left in school, God turned my plans upside down on a beach in South Carolina. I was there with a pastor who was mentoring me, and a few other adults, and a bunch of youth co-leading a mission trip. We spent that week learning about God and learning about each other. We worked hard with chainsaws and brute strength, caring for a home that had experienced some significant tornado damage, and we helped re-roof a house. Those are skills I didn't continue to have. It's one of those things you do it when you're in it, and mostly I spent my time on the ground chopping up wood. It was in the middle of that summer, and it was hot, and one night when we finished our work for the day, we decided to make our way to the beach. It was late, So we did our evening devotions with the roar of the waves in the background, and at the end of our worship, it was dark. I don't know if you've ever been on a beach in the dark, but there's something captivating and peaceful about the sound of the waves. When we looked out over the water, we could see nothing but water and a sky full of stars. It was beautiful. And kids being kids, and it being summer and hot, the kids asked us, Can we go play in the water? So we agreed, and off they went, splashing and giggling about how cold the water was and how good it felt. I stayed behind, though, right where we had our devotions, captivated by the beauty of God's creation, the soft sand under me, the stars above, and the crashing of the waves. Soon, though, it was as if I were on the beach alone. I forgot all about the kids, and I was really grateful that there were some other adults in that space, because I was lost in prayer, and I knew that my life had to go in a different direction than I'd planned. I knew that my calling from God, which had come at summer camp as a youth many years before and lay dormant while I tried to push it away and pursue other things, was reawakening that summer. After a long talk with God, I knew that I had to pursue something different. And that night on the beach, I promised God. I said to God, okay, okay, if ministry is really what you want for me, if it's really what you made me for, because that's what I heard God say to me, 
then here I am, send me. In just a few short minutes on the beach, God reoriented my life. And much like Saul, and like Peter in our scripture lessons, God changed my direction and sent me out in ministry in a new way that I hadn't quite planned for. In today's gospel lesson, we find the disciples out fishing in the midst of their grief, presumably trying to make sense of all that has occurred. Jesus had been put to death on a cross. He was laid in a tomb, and three days later they found that tomb empty. Jesus appeared to them to tell them that he was alive, not once, but twice, so that all the disciples would know and believe. And then Jesus sent them out into the world to tell others this good news. That's a lot for any of us to handle. But fishing was familiar work. It was comforting. If you remember the disciples' call stories, many of the disciples were fishing when Jesus invited them from their boats to come and follow and join him in ministry. Fishing was familiar and comfortable. It was something they didn't have to think too much about. And so while they did that routine work, they could reflect upon their experiences. But all night long, the disciples caught nothing. And when morning came, they found a man standing on the shore. When they revealed that they'd been unsuccessful in their labors, Jesus sent them back out into the water with instructions, and they caught more fish than they knew what to do with. When the disciples got to shore with their impressive catch, Peter beating them because he jumped off the boat to swim back first, there was Jesus with a roaring fire ready for breakfast. He had set the table before they even got back. Where did he get the fish? He's Jesus. And so the disciples ate and talked and laughed. And when they finished eating, it was time for Jesus to meet Peter in that place of hurt. After denying Christ three times, it was time for Jesus to bring Peter back into the community, to invite him once again to come and follow and to give him a new charge, to convert him and transform his life forever. Think back to the moments that happened before this story. The night that Jesus was arrested three times, Peter denied knowing Jesus. He was ashamed. He felt terrible about that. And he did his best to move forward. There isn't a lot of record of scripture in scripture of Jesus and Peter's interactions between that night and this beachside breakfast. But based on our own experiences, it's probably safe to say that Peter had a lot of shame for his actions. It might have been hard to look Jesus in the eye, knowing that when Jesus had needed him most, he stepped aside and denied knowing him at all. Peter needed to experience forgiveness and God's love anew. Peter also needed to forgive himself and to see what his place would be in the continuing story. And so Jesus came to the shore that morning to meet Peter where he was, to welcome him back into community, to allow him to forgive himself, to set aside his shame, and to go about the work that Jesus needed him to do in the world. And so as they sat on the beach talking that morning, three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And each time Peter responds with, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It wasn't enough, though, for Peter to echo that response once. He could have just brushed it off the first time, not even hearing what Jesus said, maybe even the second time. But the third time, Scripture tells us Peter got a little frustrated. He says, yes, Lord, of course you know that I love you. He could no longer hide from Jesus' calling. And Jesus responds, then go and feed my sheep. Care for my people. Go and tell the world the good news. Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, had been met in the place that he most needed God to meet him, on the fishing boat and at the beach. Peter, whose shame at denying Jesus had prevented him from living the way that Jesus wanted him to, was met with so much love 
that the God of second chances came and allowed him to forgive himself, to experience conversion and transformation, to love and live as a disciple once again. It's not an accident that scripture tells us Jesus asked him three times. It's on purpose. One for each of those times that Peter denied who Jesus was. And one for each of the times that calls him to go forward, to take the experiences that he had and to move out into the world, to build the church and care for people. Though Peter, and all of us, have fallen short and sinned and done what we swore we wouldn't do, Jesus gives Peter another chance. And Jesus gives us another chance, and another, and another, reconciling us with love to go out and serve and follow and feed God's sheep. When I think about this story, I'm struck by the ways that Jesus shows up in the disciples' lives. He meets them exactly where they need to be. He goes and finds them and searches them out. Last week when we talked about Thomas, Jesus met him in the upper room behind the locked doors. Even though he'd already been there, even though all the other disciples had seen, Thomas needed Jesus to meet him there too. And so he does. Peter, a fisherman by trade, in his grief, even though he's seen Jesus, is still worried about this denial, wondering what's next. And so he goes out fishing. And that's exactly where Jesus meets him as well. He cooks him breakfast and offers up a big heaping plate of love and forgiveness on that beach. In our story from Acts today, Saul, who had been persecuting Christians, is met on the road by Jesus, blinded for a few days because that's what it took to get his attention. And then, as a result, he gets a whole new name and a new identity, He turns his life 180 degrees around, and instead of persecuting Christians, he becomes a great missionary of the church, dedicated to building the church and telling everyone he could tell about the good news of God's love. It's amazing the ways that God shows up to meet us, right where we need God most. I met God on a beach in South Carolina, right at the middle of my college career, where I needed to make some decisions about what was next for me. Though that experience was not as dramatic as Paul's, it did change my life and reoriented my trajectory. God comes to God's people to change their lives and to transform them. God meets us in the places where we need God most. For Peter, it was on the beach. For Paul, it was on the road. For me, it was in the crashing waves and the starry night sky next to the ocean. God always shows up in unexpected places so that we might be brought back into community, transformed by love and sent out in mission to the world. The questions that Jesus asks Peter in our gospel lesson today are the same that he asks of us. Friends, do you love me? And when we say, yes, Lord, of course we love you, we're doing our best. Jesus says, then go. Go out and tell the story of my love. Go out and build the church. Go out and be a friend and a neighbor and a family member. Go out to meet the needs of a friend and of a stranger. Go out to build community and to bring others in as you tell them about this amazing God that we serve. Friends, God is here in our midst, calling us to live lives filled with love and transformation, called from the places where we find ourselves now to a new and exciting adventure that only God knows. We are called from one thing to the next, from where we are now to where God wants us to go. If only we're willing to say yes, to go and feed sheep, to care for people, and to follow Jesus. Friends, as we meet Christ in our worship today, as we meet Jesus at the communion table, our own breakfast of sorts, though I'm sorry I don't have a beach for you, our scripture messages beg us to take a good look at our lives 
to pay attention to the places that God is calling us. That little tap that stirs your soul, the tug that you feel in one direction or another, the people that you see in our community that need a helping hand or a kind word or even just a smile. Christ is inviting us to go out and to tell the good news, to follow Jesus into places where we've never gone before and places where we never thought we would go. Who could have imagined Saul becoming one of the most prominent missionaries in the early church? Who could have imagined Peter, after denying that he even knew Jesus three times, becoming the rock on which the church is built? And who could imagine what God would do in you and in me if only we are willing to go and follow? Friends, these conversion stories are about our lives too. They're about the ways that God shows up, meets us where we are, gives us a hug, embraces us, and sends us forward into the world. So friends, may we open ourselves to the possibilities that God has for us. May we open ourselves to transformation as we seek to become better disciples each and every day. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join me in singing You Satisfy the Hungry Heart, number 629 in your hymnals.
Please be seated. Friends, we come together in prayer as we do each week. And for those of you who are here in person, you have your purple prayer sheets in your bulletins. Those of you who are online may have had them emailed to you. And if anyone online or in person has not received those things and would like to, please let us know in the church office. A couple of things to highlight this morning. We lift up prayers for Penny Hedman, a friend of Dina Svoboda, who is dealing with health issues. For Mark Bauer, also a friend of Dina, who has been diagnosed with blood cancer. We lift up prayers of thanksgiving for Roy and John Gleason, who have returned home safely from their trip. We continue to lift up prayers for Carlene as she is finished with her treatments. We lift up prayers for David DeShong's family, who passed away on Friday, April 22nd in North Lima, Ohio. That's Naomi Harris's nephew. For John, Johnny Haddix, John and Judy Haddix's son, who was diagnosed with COVID and who is doing a little bit better. We continue to lift up prayers for baby Sebastian, who's a newborn and newly adopted son of Kent, Matt and Bradley, co-workers of Kent Shelko, who was born with cocaine and fentanyl in his system. For Lorna, who is doing finals, is she done? She's done and she's home. So we celebrate with her, hopefully the successful finals and final papers that she has completed and uh, some wonderful rest and respite. But we also pray for her because she's developed a whole new family at school and she will miss them while she's home even while reconnecting with folks who are here. We lift up Bob, a friend of Dale and Cindy Lepo, who died this past week, and Scott Crudson, Marilyn Knapwalko's son, who is cancer-free, and we celebrate that. We also give thanks for a successful surgery for Rita Clyburn, who was here at some point this week, and so we give thanks for that. I give thanks to our tech team who's been running things in the back and writing prayer requests from our folks who are online. John Hayes, who is not here with us, asks for prayers for his dad, Dwight, who, has been mo- who is being moved to a memory care facility. Um, his dementia has reached a point where he can no longer provide for his needs in his current facility. So we pray for the family in the midst of that transition and for Dwight as well. We also lift up prayers for Roger Ward, a friend of Judy Haddock's in West Virginia, who's been experiencing some health concerns. So we pray for healing in that regard. And we pray for healing for all those of us who have colds and tickles in our throats. I know I'm not the only one coughing today. So we lift up healing prayers all around this space and extend them to our folks online as well. Friends, let us pray together, joining our hearts in a moment of silence. Holy God, we come before you in prayer this morning, asking you to hear our prayers as we continue to listen for your call. If only we... If only the world heard your voice as clearly as Paul and as Peter and recognized its truth and its compassion. If only we heard your voice reminding us to feed your sheep. But so often we fail to heed your call. Open our ears and our hearts to hear and to respond. Grant us strength to follow where you lead to go where you send us, to be your voice in the world. Today we offer our prayers for the world. Lord, there is so much violence and no solutions, at least not easy ones. So much that has been done rightly and wrongly, fear and panic that blinds us from what is right and from the call that you give to all of us. God, we pray for our world for an end to the violence that is around us. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Heal us. God, we lift prayers that those who find prejudice a way of life might have their eyes opened. We pray that those who are trapped and caught up in the lies and trappings of this world might come to know joy and freedom in following you. 
We pray for all those who have been displaced and those who are living with or making difficult decisions. Hear us, O oh God. Draw us close to you. Turn us around that we might experience conversion and transformation in your love. God, we lift up prayers for all those who are physically and emotionally unwell. God, your healing spirit is among us and within us and around us at all times. God, we pray for all the places in our lives where you need to turn us around and convert us because we know that we cannot do it on our own. We pray for those requests that have been lifted before you this day, both spoken aloud or written on Facebook and in the silence of our hearts. We pray for our friends and for our family, for those we know who are ill and who are recovering, for those who are lonely and anxious, confused or stressed. Hear us, O oh God. Strengthen us as we listen to your call. Transform our lives so that we might leave this place truly changed and ready to be messengers of the good news, going to care for your world and all those you have placed within it. And now, holy God, we lift our voices together using the words that Jesus taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God has given us so many good gifts, and we give thanks to God, acknowledging that everything that we have is first a gift from God. And so today we lift our hearts to God as we listen to our offertory.
Thank you both so much for that. Friends, I invite you to join me in our prayer of dedication. Worthy are you, O God, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Receive these gifts of thanksgiving and praise and use them for your glory and the good of your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Amen. Friends, we are going to take communion now. If you have not yet picked up your little communion elements from the back, we encourage you to do so now. Roseanne is standing in the back with them, just in case you need one. It's also a great time to peel off that top wrapper and expose the little wafers there, and the foil wrapper and expose your grape juice, but I do ask that you hold on to those things until all can receive together, and I will instruct you on when to do that. We're going to join together in the liturgy, beginning on page 16 in your bulletins, or 16 in your hymnals, and it will start in the middle of all the red text that the pastor says there. Friends, God is with us. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread gave thanks to God, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to God and gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day that you raised Christ from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of bread. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, the church has continued to break the bread and share the cup since that time. And so today, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. And we proclaim together the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come in. And we pray. Holy God, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, you and I are God's beloved children, and this table is the Lord's. In the United Methodist Church, we serve bread and grape juice so that all may feel safe and secure participating at God's table. And we invite every person to participate in Holy Communion who seeks a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member of this church or of any church, but simply come offering yourself to God as we share in this holy meal. Friends, the bread in which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, I invite you to receive the gifts of Holy Communion, the body of Christ broken for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us, meeting us right where we are. Grant us the courage to go into the world in the strength of your spirit, to give ourselves for others, to feed your sheep and care for your people and follow you wherever you lead us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Friends, we invite you to stand as you are able and join us in our closing hymn today, The Summons, which is in the little black books in your pews. Friends, the God of love and second and third and fourth and so on chances is calling your name and my name. The God of love is calling us. Will you come and follow me? So friends, I hope that our response is yes. I hope that our response is to offer our lives to God and allow God to be at work in us, to go wherever God leads So go from this place filled with the love of God and the peace of Jesus Christ. Go in the power of the Holy Spirit to follow where God calls us to go. Amen.